Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to uh, Rice University's uh, Baker Institute for Public Policy for this evening's uh, keynote address on the U.S. strategy to combat neglected tropical diseases and the ongoing work between the United States and, and Mexico uh, to address this shared challenge through uh, border health initiatives. Uh, tonight's event is actually a precursor uh, for tomorrow's conference on the U.S. and Mexico addressing a shared legacy of neglected tropical diseases and poverty, which also will feature a distinguished set of speakers, including uh, Dr. Mercedes Juan Lopez, who is the uh, Secretary of the Me is Mexican Ministry of Health, uh, Dr. Roberto Tapia Conyers, Director General of the Carlos Slim Foundation, uh, the Honorable Sarah Davis, the Texas State Representative for Rice University's district and strong supporter of uh, neglected tropical disease awareness and increased uh, surveillance in Texas. Uh, I would like to thank the Abbey Foundation, which has sponsored this conference in cooperation with the Baylor College of Medicine, uh, their National School of Tropical Medicine, and the END Fund. I would also like to uh, recognize uh, the work of two of the Baker Institute's research centers, uh, which were instrumental in organizing this uh, conference. The Center for Health and Biosciences with Dr. Kirsten Matthews, Dr. Jennifer Herricks, Dr. Peter Hotez, and Dr. Vivian Ho, as well as the Baker uh, Mexico uh, Center, led by Dr. Tony uh, Payan. I'm very pleased that this collaboration uh, between research centers has led to hosting these discussions uh, this evening and tomorrow. Uh, tonight's keynote and tomorrow's conference are the first joint project between the Baker Institute's Mexico Center and, and the Center for Health and Biosciences. Now we hope to expand more uh, in this area of collaboration and continue to work uh, identifying barriers for cross-border disease control initiatives determine improved preventive measures and ascertain areas where research could be conducted uh, collaboratively. So it is important work which requires recognition that neglected tropical diseases are not just located in developing countries, but are linked to extreme poverty, which also occurs in the United States and Mexico. In fact, Dr. Peter Hotez, about a year ago, had an op-ed in the New York Times which caught a lot of people's attention because he was talking about all these uh, so-called exotic diseases, tropical diseases, and the punchline of the op-ed was, ladies and gentlemen, they're all present in South Texas. So the nexus is really disease and poverty. It's not so much geographical. But if you look at it over one million U.S. households and five million people in Mexico are living on less than two dollars a day. Uh, this puts them at risk for several debilitating diseases which don't often kill but will lead to long-term disability impacting on their productivity. In children, this also means limiting their access to education which also limits their ability to get out of the cycle of poverty. So we are privileged to have an outstanding expert on these issues here tonight uh, to address these challenges and the role for the United States in playing, is playing in combating neglected tropical diseases. Dr. Mitchell Wolf is the Deputy Assistant Secretary at the Office of Global Health in the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. He previously served with the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the well-known CDC as the director of their offices in Thailand and Vietnam, as well as director of the CDC's Global AIDS Program in Thailand and Asia. His full biography is in your program, and uh, you could refer to his uh, very distinguished uh, expertise in this area. So please uh, join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Mitch Wolf to the Baker Institute podium. Hi, can you, can you hear me okay? Thanks very much. Um, this is the first time I've given this talk, so I'm very excited actually to do it. And I apologize in advance if I'm trying to get the technology and the slides to match the talk. So sorry you're a little bit of a guinea pig. 
Um, it's great to see everybody here. I was at this one o'clock session uh, which on a student careers panel, which was really fun. I was a little worried about what it would be like after a reception at six, but I see everyone is awake, so that's great. <laughs> um, so I work at the, um, uh, in the Office of Global Affairs, um, and I'm a Deputy Assistant Secretary in the Department of Health and Human Services. So what that means is I report to my boss, the Assistant Secretary, and he reports to the Secretary of Health, uh, Sylvia Burwell. Um, I'm a doctor and an epidemiologist, and as you said, I was, I was at CDC for the past 16 years and the last 10 abroad in Thailand and Vietnam. And then um, when it was time to come back to the U.S., I actually wanted to come back to the, uh, Washington to learn about I got very interested in um, health policy when I was abroad, and so I wanted to try that, and I got lucky enough that there was a job um, for me. Um, during my last couple of years in Thailand, we were actually, and they still are, experiencing a very bad um, outbreak of dengue fever, where a lot of Thais, a lot of expats got dengue. I have a bunch of friends who got dengue, and so, um, through that, I'm familiar with some of the uh, NTDs we're going to be talking about. Um, one thing I want to talk to you about is um, diplomacy. Part of my job, a good, good part of my job and our office are really being health diplomats, working on global health diplomacy, and I'm going to try to explain just a little bit about what that is. We work to connect um, public health and foreign policy and draw that connection to try to be a catalyst to move policies forward. One thing we say about what diplomacy is, is trying to get things on other people's agendas that might not other, otherwise have been there and getting them to advance that agenda. So that's a good part of what we do. Our main counterparts are um, foreign governments. So we are diplomats with foreign governments a lot, but we also work with NGOs, with academic institutions, with private industry, and with individuals. We, our ultimate goal is protecting the health and security of Americans. But as I said this morning, uh, I mean this afternoon, there are other reasons to work in global health. It's a diplomatic tool to get countries to uh, work together in many different areas. Helping the uh, health of a population builds both their security and also us as partners in trade and security and many other things. And of course, there's a humanitarian reason, but we're often asked why is the US involved in global health when there's so much need in the US. And I would say that um, we're involved in global health for the reasons I said, and it is primarily for, to detect, to um, protect Americans. But there are other good reasons. And the Department of Health and Human Services, only a very small proportion of our budget is actually global health. Most of it does go domestic, which is what we think is appropriate. We're also involved in other areas that you might not immediately consider to be global health but I think are important for this audience, especially students, to think about. Um, laws that affect the availability of generic drugs, um, food, labeling, f food labeling with a, affects individuals' ability or um, ability to make informed choices. Um, and we do get involved across sectors in trade, in agriculture, in security, in addition to the traditional health sector. And, um, a policy has to take all the sectors into consideration. And I want to just for a minute talk a little bit about Ebola this year um, to demonstrate why I think global health diplomacy and why HHS has to be engaged as, as global health diplomats. OK, now is where I'm going to try my uh, technology. So OK, perfect. OK, so the Ebola outbreak um, should remind everybody that diseases don't respect borders. Each red dot on this map represents where an Ebola case occurred in um, this year, last year, in 2014. Obviously, viruses do not need a visa to cross a border or to get on an airplane. And it was able to do that um, pretty effectively um, this year. It, diseases will travel as fast as the conveyance that they're on. In the case of Ebola, it got to US by um, a plane from West Africa. There were direct flights. Those quickly stopped, but there were direct flights. I took a direct flight. It, takes, it took me eight hours to get from Washington to Monrovia. Um, 
So this is just one kind of small example to show why protecting the health of Americans has to be a global effort. And I'm happy to ask, answer questions about that later, too. Um, so HHS, we have an obligation to act globally, and we have a group of offices and agencies that have a real depth and breadth of capacity um, that are hard to find anywhere else in the world. For example, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention or the National Institutes of Health or NIH. We really, the U.S. really engages globally more than I think any other country. And there's a real demand for it. The World Health Organization and other countries often specifically call on us to come and respond to assist with outbreaks or technical assistance and other health issues, as CDC did with their biggest response that they've ever had in their history for um, Ebola. I think they uh, had over 2,000 people deployed. Um, and the National Institutes of Health, with, which got very involved in development of vaccines and um, therapeutics for Ebola. So um, our responses involve multiple agencies. This is a uh, confusing organizational chart of Department of Health and Human Services. But I want to show a little bit of how we, um, how we responded. So the secretary on the top there in orange, she ran HHS's part of the Ebola, um, of the Ebola response, and I was on uh, phone calls or individual or in group meetings with her um, every day for several months <clears throat> so she was she was um, she was very involved um, CD, CDC there um, do you see uh, under the under the gold box they led much of the underground response they deployed like I said thousands of staff working on communication surveillance reporting laboratory infection control border safety, opening CDC offices in each country, leading a vaccine trial. The National Institutes of Health uh, is currently working on a vaccine trial in Guinea and was involved in assessments of medical treatments for Ebola. And then us, we're over here. And just a little bit, these are operating divisions under the um, HHS that work our kind of semi-autonomous nations, I would say. And then um, these on the side here are called staff divisions that really staff the secretary and work very closely supporting um, the secretary and her office. So we coordinate between the secretary, other HHS divisions, the White House, the World Health Organization, and uh, ministries of health. We're engaged as diplomats with um, global stakeholders, stakeholders to ensure that the US provides a coordinated and effective response to threats. As part of um, Ebola capacity building, uh, post-Ebola capacity building, shoot, I don't see them on here. I'm sorry. The, oh, there they are. OK. Shoot. Oh, there we go. HRSA, or the Health Resources um, Services Administration, which really is almost entirely a domestic agency, they are doing something new, which is um, strengthening health systems and training for future doctors and nurses. So I think that's very exciting. So that brings me back a little bit to why global health diplomacy is so important. We need to maintain and develop relationships with foreign governments and international organizations and build trust, both to affect foreign policy and to enable us to have access um, in times of need. So I didn't mainly come here to talk about Ebola, but I thought it was important just to give you an idea of how the US engages abroad, about how we responded, and um, because we're often asked about this. And again, I'm happy to answer any questions about what the US has done um, after this. So now let's uh, talk about the border. Um, the US-Mexican border is a very dynamic region. It's about 2,000 miles long. Um, and the stretch of land, when we talk about the border, is about 60 miles um, wide on each side of the border, has a population of 15 million people, many of whom are underserved, suffer from high rates of poverty, and have poor health outcomes, or poorer health outcomes than the rest of, um, comparable than the rest of the United States. And it also has patterns of disease that are distinct from other parts of the US. So for example, here on the border, you find uh, Chagas disease, cutaneous leishmaniasis, dengue fever. If you've not heard of those, and I'm not sure about this audience, you, but if you haven't, I'm sure you will by tomorrow evening. Um, 
in general, they're kind of unknown in most parts of the United States. Um, they're classified as neglected tropical diseases or NTDs, and um, the governments of U.S. and Mexico have a bilateral have had a bilateral agreement for more than a decade to address overall health and wellness at the border and um, to improve systems technically, for example, disease surveillance and reporting, not only to treat NTDs, but also to address kind of the source of the problem. And I'm really glad in my introduction you talked about poverty because that's actually going to be one of my main points here before we finish. So um, just a little bit about definitions of NTDs and you know what are they and why are they at the border. So there's a group of 14 parasitic bacterial and viral infectious diseases that are really the source of tremendous suffering because of their disfigurement, debilitation, and sometimes fatal impact. They're called neglected because they may have been wiped out in richer parts of the world, but basically affect now um, large numbers of the poorest and most marginalized communities in, and conflict areas in the world. However, um, more than a billion people, including 875 million children, are infected with one or more NTDs worldwide. And an, an additional two billion are at risk, and each year about half a million people die as a result. At the border, as I said, Chagas disease, cutaneous, leishmaniasis, and dengue are the most common NTDs. So let me just spend a minute on each one here about what they are. Um, so Chagas disease is a parasitic infection. It's 50 times more prevalent in the southern US than the rest of the country. It's spread by the bite of a um, tritomine bug, sometimes called a kissing bug, because it bites around the mouth. and they're infected by a parasite called uh, Trypanosoma cruzi. And like, ma like most diseases, many people who are infected never develop serious symptoms, but about 20 to 30 percent of those infected will develop um, debil debilitating and sometimes life-threatening medical problems, including heart failure. In the US, 300,000 people are infected with the disease, and most don't know it. And just as an aside, you know, it's good to know that most diseases are like that. When West Nile virus came out, for example, or even in Ebola, we have found that there is a, uh, the majority of people who show immune response to an infection actually never had symptoms or only had, had minor symptoms. Uh, cutaneous leishmaniasis is another uh, parasite spread by the bite of the sand fly and in injects the parasite under the skin. The disease has a long incubation period, so um, symptoms might not develop for weeks or months, and it starts out looking like a mosquito bite, like you can see here. And then I have some, a few pictures um, about, you know, further advanced leishmaniasis, and I'm not trying to freak people out, but actually there's a reason why I'm showing. You can cover your eyes if, if you don't want to see, but there's a reason why I'm showing those. Um, I think that, um, so now I'll go on so you don't have to see them all. But I, I think that actually, you know, my experience in medical school, one of, the, one of the things that really struck me was that all the diseases I had heard about, like diabetes and rheumatoid arthritis, or ones that I just heard about a lot but didn't really understand, are all very serious, debilitating diseases that affect people hugely. And I never, you know, it just, kind of struck me. And so when we're talking about these, I just think it's important to show how people are really affected. Um, it's very much, you know, we work, like when we worked in Thailand and Vietnam, and you're giving a lot of money to organizations and doing a lot of administrative work and paperwork and political stuff, I found it extremely important to go visit a clinic. And if you go, you know, to a HIV clinic in Addis Ababa, um, you know, the, their big general hospital or in Zambia or in Vietnam or Cambodia, it really helps you uh, remember why you're doing the work you do. So this um, slide shows uh, disease distribution approximately of uh, leishmaniasis, and as you can see, um, all of Texas is a risk zone. You're welcome for that. And then uh, dengue, dengue is a, I talked a little bit about dengue before, mosquito-borne illness like m malaria. It's accompanied by a rash. Sometime it's known, and it used to really be known as breakbone fever um, because of the intense joint and muscle pain and headache that you get. And I've, I haven't had it, I don't think, but um, 
I've, I've witnessed it. It can be very severe, and it's fatal in about 2.5% of cases. It can also seem very mild, and so it makes it difficult to track. Uh, it can be more severe the more times you get it. So it's difficult to know actually how many people really are infected with dengue, especially the first time. We know there's been an um, uptick in dengue on the border, but again, because, of, because the first infection especially is often mild, we don't really know um, how much. And you know, when people get the flu, which is a typical for the first time you're infected with den dengue, most people don't um, go to the hospital or get a diagnosis for dengue. Um, and the way diseases are reported, and we track them, is really by physicians reporting um, diseases to health departments. This highlighted area, oh, whoops, sorry. Uh, there's supposed to be a highlighted area, but you can see with the red, the, that area in the south is really where, um, where dengue is present in the US. And you can see most of the cases are really um, concentrated in the border area. So one of, our, one of the main goals of the Department of Health and Human Services is to advance um, health, safety, and well-being of all Americans. At the border, our goal is to provide international leadership, which is another function of global health diplomacy, to try to optimize health and the quality of life, which is a direct response to both countries realizing that a binational mechanism was needed to address health disparities. So in order to do that, we need to understand a little bit about the why of um, disparities. Why is there such a high concentration of NDDs at the border? I think understanding whys can help give you a roadmap on what different entities should do and what HHS should do and how to develop sound health, health policy. I think it's why places like the Baker Institute and programs like Center for Health and Biosciences and Mexico Center are so important, making the link between um, public health and policy development. So um, let's look here at um, Houston. Um, this is the Smith Clinic, which I believe is on Holly Hall Street. Please correct me if I got that wrong. Um, and they have weekly a floor that turns into a tropical disease center for half a day to address NTDs. And the patients who are treated at this clinic are not necessarily people who have been traveling. They're people who may have picked up diseases right here or, or in this area. And so it's important to point out that the Smith Clinic is, is uh, located in Houston's Greater Fifth Ward, which um, has one of the lowest median household incomes and falls below the national poverty guideline for a family of four, which brings us a little bit to kind of why this is happening, which is that poverty is a overwhelming risk factor for NTDs. And poverty at the border is often characterized by things like lack of air conditioning or lack of window screens, inadequate sanitation, high unemployment, low education levels and significant shortages of healthcare providers. And all of these conditions, these kind of substandard conditions, combined with other important factors for NTDs like weather, and exacerbated by large movements of people who cross the border every day, and all together these factors create environments for NTDs on both sides of the border. Which brings us to the next step and a reason why I'm here, which is to talk for a few minutes about how the border and NTDs affects um, global health policy and what the U.S. government's doing to address NTDs, particularly at the U.S.-Mexico border and in collaboration with Mexico. I know you're going to hear more about these details tomorrow, and I just want to give a little broad overview of my perspective, including the role of diplomacy. The U.S. and Mexico have been working together for more than a decade to address issues including NTDs, but also including diabetes, hypertension, tuberculosis, HIV, um, and mental health issues. And both countries recognize the need to create kind of a formal structure to work under that's unique to the border and that it needed to be a bilateral effort between the U.S. and Mexico. So as a result, the U.S.-Mexico Border Health Commission was created in the year 2000 and then designated as a public health organization with an executive order, a U.S. presidential executive order in um, 2004. So um, the commission is led by secretaries of health of the U.S., 
One of these is the Secretary of Health of the U.S. and one is the Secretary of Health in Mexico. The Secretary of Health in Mexico, I think, is coming tomorrow, so that's great. Uh, ours is uh, Sylvia Burwell. Um, the, in addition to them, there's a whole infrastructure under them as leaders with health officers and prominent community health professionals um, of all 10 border states. On the US side, it's run out of my office, the Office of Global Affairs, and it engages government and non-governmental organizations, academic institutions, public and private stakeholders from both countries to get together and try to develop sustainable solutions uh, for, for each nation's border most, most pressing health um, challenges on the border, which are very similar. So as a result, the commission recently launched something called the Healthy Border 2020 Initiative. That initiative creates goals for many of the major health problems along the border, including chronic and infectious diseases, maternal and child health, and access to health care. And one thing we talked about actually in the afternoon session, someone asked, what is the most, I can't remember the exact question, but what is the biggest gap or the most underfunded area with the biggest need? My answer was um, non-communicable diseases like, um, like uh, just diabetes, hypertension, cancer. But um, a lot of these have to do with poverty. Um, all the issues that that I've talked about that we addressed in the Binational Committee and NTDs really have a very common risk factor, which is poverty, poor nutrition, poor education, lack of access to health care. So much of the, the 2020 initiative and the work we do on the border is really directed at addressing those um, those risk factors. So we're our goal for HHS, and this is not necessarily, necessarily the goal of each entity, our main goal is to try to eliminate or at least alleviate the cause of the problems, access to health care, for example, because of poverty. Um, for example, in, in 2012, the commission collaborated with PAHO, the Pan American Health Organization, to host um, over 90 border-wide events that were intended to in increase vaccine coverage in infants which would address a key problem in maternal and child health, which is infant mortality. And they also created a venue to reach uh, 13,000 residents um, that resulted in increased vaccination coverage, especially in rural areas, and provided an opportunity to educate populations at risk of chronic and infectious disease. So while that may seem somewhat unrelated to NTDs, um, it's actually one of the most important things we can do because by eliminating health disparities, we're working to help eliminate risk factors for NTDs. This commission also partners with other US, US government agencies and has been a, has a formal agreement with the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, and as part of this partnership, the Border Health Commission and the EPA have organized environmental health training sessions for border health community workers. And environmental health is one of the key priorities for the commission and is also part of the WHO, or the World Health Organization's new global strategy to prevent neglected tropical diseases through improved access to water, sanitation, and hygiene. And one thing I left out is our office is the main HHS counterpart to uh, the World Health Organization, and we are involved with putting resolutions through the World Health Organization that they pass, which really help decide what WHO and countries are going to focus on. Um, in addition to the Border Health Commission, the CDC does a significant amount of work on the border, and it has been since they were founded in um, 1942. I want to talk a little bit about the history of CDC. It was originally founded to combat one specific tropical disease that was a problem in the US at the time, which was malaria. So that's why CDC actually uh, was originally called the Office of Malaria Control in war areas and is headquartered in Atlanta. That's why CDC is in Atlanta. Malaria was endemic in the South, where it's hot and humid, as some of you may know who live here. And it was impacting Southern military bases, like places like Ellington Field. So I'm not sure if everyone considers Houston to be in the South, but I do know that you had malaria. By uh, 1951, the office helped to eliminate malaria from the continental U US and then moved on to other things 
to where now people always ask me, are you really working on the zombie apocalypse preparedness? But this is from the CDC website. You can look that up. Uh, the Communicable Disease Center uh, was established in 1946 in the, office, the same offices as the malaria control in war areas. Uh, they had had a lot of success with malaria, and so their mission was field investigation and training and communicable disease control. They expanded beyond just uh, malaria to communicable diseases. And with expanding ma mandates, uh, CDC was later renamed uh, National Communicable Disease Center, the Centers for Disease Control, and then the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, but it's still called CDC because of that brand people know and it sounds good. Um, so to get back a little bit to the work on the border, uh, CDC's Dengue Branch, which is based in Puerto Rico, which is, uh, they get a lot of applicants for jobs there. Um, the Dengue Branch has assisted in multiple dengue outbreaks, uh, outbreak investigations in the U.S.-Mexico border, most recently in 2005, as shown on this slide. Um, and it continues to work with the Mexican government, providing training on surveillance and laboratory diagnostics, health promotion efforts um, for dengue and other NTDs. Currently, it's uh, supporting the development of a mobile app for community surveillance that should launch near the end of next year. And I'm very excited to see that and see how it works because there's been a lot of work um, in, in Africa with HIV money for a disease reporting with mobile phones you know, and texting. And now we're actually bringing that technology here. Um, the U.S.-Mexico CDC, it's the CDC um, U.S.-Mexico unit in San Diego also conducts binational infectious disease surveillance on the border um, based in El Paso, Southern Arizona, and Southern California counties. And it um, really tries to help with investigating communicable disease cases with partner health officials across the border um, in the U.S. and Mexico. And these kinds of activities are very important to help lay the groundwork for additional cross-border work that can be built upon. Cross-border work can be very difficult. I, I, ha I actually now, am, I've only been in Washington for a year, so I only have a little bit of experience between the U.S. and Mexico cross-border work. But I know from Thailand, Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, you know, different systems are very difficult to get them to work together. I know, I'm not sure about, I know academic institutions have some bureaucracy and the U.S. government has to be worse. And, you know, it's just very difficult to adapt to other countries' bureaucratic, you know, ways, ways of working. And that actually ends up being a barrier to being able to do cross-border, you know, disease control activities. And it's something that the U.S. is really starting to pay attention to and trying to figure out how to become more flexible so we can work with other countries better. I think NTDs are a really good example of how health is not always determined at the um, doctor's office. Health and well-being are, are really depend on the circumstances where we're born, where we grow up, where we live, work, and age, and the systems that are put in place to help deal with illnesses. It's not a new concept that we have to work both inside and outside of the health sector to improve health outcomes and address these um, disparities, but part of our Part of our work is really trying to get the different sectors to talk to and coordinate and plan with each other. So for the last six years, the Border Health Commission has been hosting a U.S.-Mexico TB consortium meeting and has also hosted binational reproductive health, infectious disease, health research conferences and forums. And, th and these meetings bring together health actors in government that don't necessarily always talk together or work, even though they're or work together, even though they're working on the same same programs, and it also includes private sector and NGOs, and it's really a useful tool to get people from health, but also from trade and from agriculture to get together and talk and try to plan programs and really educate each other about what they do, so they can learn how to um, how to work together. So again, in in many cases, the root cause of disease is really um, the root cause of disease or of poor health co outcomes is, is poverty. And whether it's inadequate sanitation or lack of clean water, which promotes the spread of bacterial, viral, or parasitic diseases, or the inability to purchase window screens to keep mosquitoes out or flies, or difficulty obtaining food to put on the table, poverty really has a significant impact 
in um, public health. And there are many more examples of how this is true, just more than what I just mentioned. And the health sector, while it can't really solve all of the problems of poverty, it can help because a healthier population is a more productive population. And we really need to attract health professionals to underserved areas. And I actually think that working abroad and working in underserved areas in the U.S. have a lot of a lot of similarities. So, in addition to you know, I think that a lot of people who have worked in global health and have also worked in U.S. Um, poorer uh, 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 communities, um, rural communities, really can take their skills to work in both places because they say because because of the uh, similarities. So our goal is to help build the health infrastructure to reduce barriers to healthcare access and really work to ensure that the right drugs and the right treatments reach the, and the right prevention reaches um, those who are in need. So our goal is to develop sustainable policies and partnerships regardless of political shifts that really are a central part of global health diplomacy and are closely linked with, as I said, with health outcomes and NTDs. So I do think um, this is the goal of everyone I work with, which is to find a way to protect the health and well-being of Americans and others around the world, regardless of what politics are taking place. And neglected tropical diseases are really just one of the health challenges that affect communities who are really struggling to meet other basic needs. And I hope that I've helped to kind of make the case that working on policies and structures and underlying causes to address addresses health outcomes, including NTDs, and is an important part of what I think of what the US government does and wants to do in the future. So I think we have to remember there are many um, opportunities for us to get involved, to collaborate, to meet these challenges in many different ways. And I just encourage everyone to think outside of maybe your normal sphere of interactions to try to bring together everyone who's involved with trying to work on poverty and in health. And I think that's the, the best way that, to, um, to make a difference. So thank you very much for inviting me, and I'm very happy to take questions after. And since I can't resist some Ebola, I just showed you some pictures. These are pictures of, um, of us in uh, Liberia, the, the US Public Health Service set up a um, Ebola treatment unit in Liberia, which I was lucky enough to visit. Yes? Lester Martinez, given that you did not talk about the DOD response to the Ebola, was it because the SAR out of the White Office really was a guy coordinating your effort, this, the HHS effort, and DOD efforts in the country and outside the country, or was it an, an oversight? No, we definitely coordinated and worked with DOD. I would say we didn't, we, you know, we didn't direct them. That came out of, uh, actually, they, they worked under USAID mainly. But um, we worked very closely with them, especially this unit where they, you know, they built a number of Ebola treatment units, and they were the ones that built and supplied this. And they also had uh, very important laboratories in um, Liberia and maybe other countries. So no, they were a critical part of the response, as was USAID, State Department, and um, uh, the White House. One thing that I would say, and again, you know, I'm, I'm new to Washington, so if this sounds naive, I'm sorry, I'm new, but um, our Department of Defense is unbelievable in what they can, um, what they can get in place around the world when they're asked to do it. I've never seen. I mean, I would love public health to subcontract DoD for every outbreak investigation, <laughs> because they can bring you know people and equipment quickly, very and and they know how to do logistics. So everything is done extremely high quality. So I can't really say enough good things about the DOD. And on my trip to Liberia, I actually went with the DOD that we're inspecting. And um, it was extremely impressive. And the one thing DOD is amazing at is before they go in, they um, develop their exit strategy. <laughs> when they have instruction to. <laughs> yes. So for this, they, they did, and it was amazing. 
Yes. Uh, so, so for the <coughs> neglected tropical diseases, is it as much a health care issue or an environmental issue related to, you know, uh, poor water treatment, poor sewage, uh, mosquito, not, not under control, or, or is it really that you, it's the lack of a vaccine and, and then you also have a population that doesn't get good treatment and so it gets worse over time? So I, I'll answer for me, and I invite anyone who's more expert than me to please add. <laughs> add. You know, I think it's yes to all of those. I think that, um, you know, poverty, which causes basically poor sanitation, but also poor access to care, because a lot of these diseases are not that difficult, are, are, are really treatable. And, you know, around the world, there's a major effort for these 17 NTDs to just get the drugs out because they're cheap and um, we have distribution, you know, distribution systems are kind of the problem and trying to figure out where they're going to go, but they're cheap and they really could treat a lot. So we do have to work on prevention, but I, I also think it's a matter of getting treatment out. Yes. Do you have any vaccines for any of these? Are, are you working on them? Right. So um, different entities like the NIH or I think DOD are working on them. Again, if there's someone here that's more expert, please let me know. Um, there is a promising dengue vaccine, which is incredible. And I don't know how far out that is from. Um, in clinical trials. From yeah, it's in clinical trials. Four of them mm -hmm. that cover a lot of the serotypes, I think. Mm -hmm. So I think the next one in the pipeline is dengue, which is going to be amazing. For other ones, I don't know if any on the list have, um, a lot are early, you know, in the vaccine, vaccine research, but I don't think there's anything that advanced. Ebola, sorry to talk about, oh yeah, go ahead. I can comment if Please. you don't mind. I'm the um, Associate Dean of the National School of Tropical Medicine. And in fact, in our portfolio, we have around six or seven vaccine in development. And for example, for hookworm disease and schistosomiasis vaccines, we're already in clinical trials oh. for those. So we're very uh, hopeful that indeed we can even reach to the point where we can do some uh, very pivotal efficacy studies to show that it works. And maybe to just expand on your comment and the fact that you mentioned that it is an integrated approach. So there's, there's, there has to be not only drugs, not only water sanitation, not only education, not only raising the awareness of these diseases. I think um, the, the, the platform that will make us successful is to all work together uh, and combine you know, the expertise in different areas and try to um, use different alternative strategies to complement each other and make, make the, the prevention or the treatment or the diagnosis a little bit more successful. Thank you. Thank you. That was great. Feel free to answer others, too. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, I can remember when I was a young girl that there, when you went across borders, you had to get show that you had had uh, vaccination against smallpox, for instance. Is, does any of that go on with any of our border countries? Do we? I think, I think the, only, um, the only vaccine that you have to show um, proof of is yellow fever vaccine if you've been in some of the countries in Africa, if you've been to some of the countries in Africa. I don't believe there are any other vaccines that you have to show. You said that there are 17 NTDs. Are they all curable, or are there some that are not curable? So the list, the list of NTDs, I, not all of them have like like dengue fever. Dengue does not have a known cure. It's really just supportive therapy. So not all of them have a known cure. But for a lot of them, there are simple, you know, especially a lot of the uh, worm-related diseases. There are you know simple drugs that can be administered. So sorry if I said that before, but no, it's, they're not all, they don't all have easy and simple treatments. 17 from the World Health Organization to neglected tropical diseases. Of those five are classified as what's called preventative chemotherapy treatments, which is a rapid diagnostic package that's treatable. And another five are on that list. So there's a total of 10 that were a part of what's called the London Declaration which was a group of the pharmaceutical companies and Margaret Chan from the World Health Organization coming together in 2012 to try and make strides towards these. 
So five or have known PCT treatable, including schistosomiasis and Huffman. And actually, at WHO national meetings, countries are lobbying to add additional ones um, to them. Yes, how, how would you explain that uh, Ebola did not reach Latin America? What was the reason? So, uh, two answers to that. One is just in the larger context of public health prevention. One of the biggest problems with working in public health is no one knows when you've done a great job because. Um, if you didn't, if you didn't have an outbreak, people, you don't get, you don't get credit for that, right? So example, flu, you know, the big, the flu outbreaks, bird flu or whatever, um, it's possible that all the work that we put into it and all the money help prevent it, but I can't prove it. So, um, that's, that's one issue. The other is, I think, um, so Latin America did a great job of preparing through PAHO for screening and what they were going to do if there was an, an outbreak. And we were involved in that. And, and almost all the countries were very proactive. But I think that just um, if you look at patterns of travel, there's just really not that much from there's not all that much from West Africa to um, South America compared with the United States or Europe where cases showed up. Yes. Yeah. Um, to what extent are the, the 10 border states already engaged, and to what greater extent uh, is it contemplated or imagined that they could be engaged? Yeah, I mean, that's a really good question. So um, before I arrived, we, you know, our office really wanted to take a look at this Border Health Commission and look at what the impact has been and where we could improve you know, the activities, because we have great people working on it. We don't have a lot of money. And a lot of the activities are good. They're kind of more education, communication, bringing some people, bringing, you know, different sectors and different states together. So this Healthy Border 2020, which was just released a few months ago, is really a framework that we're now going to sit down and do strategic planning on how can we, I think, be more focused and measure impact because I think it's been very difficult. It's very difficult to measure impact in those kind of activities. And so that's something we're in the midst of now. Um, I don't know if Secretary Mercedes is going to talk about that, but that's something we're engaged now to really try to see how we can uh, do a better job uh, in the future and what our priorities are going to be within that Healthy Border 2020. Sorry, yes. Yeah, so we, we recently had a project with the um, Department of Defense, Department of Navy, um, involving a malaria control um, because they had the recognition that malaria was really sapping the, the uh, uh, military was a pool of malaria res reservoir for malaria in many um, endemic countries so that seems like an example of where you have other departments becoming interested in infectious diseases um, it seems like there might be opportunities for that with the, the, the tropical diseases since it's so integrated with finance and other areas do, do you see those opportunities emerging or yeah, it's a great idea. I mean, HHS and DOD probably could do a better job, you know, working with each other. They, we, but we both, we, we do work to, together, but we also operate very independently. And I think that, um, I mean, I think that's a great point. I, I don't have an answer for you right now exactly how we should do it, because there's always barriers and everybody's busy and people have their own mandates that you have to fulfill. But I do think that giving, you know, given how much DOD is really expanding their kind of public health presence. And we, we for example, we have a person in our office assigned to PACOM in the Pacific Command. And we've been talking about whether we should have people assigned to every COM, you know, because, because of the amount of work that they're doing. So it's a great point. It's something we're thinking about. I think we need to do a better job. And I think one of them is going to be, you know, there's nothing like face-to-face -face interactions because we all, um, I don't know about you, but I get hundreds of emails a day and, you know, phone calls, but actually going to meet people is the most important thing. And so I, I think that's something we really should, should be doing. And we should be taking people from DOD into our office. Yes? Has there been any attempt to involve mobile units going back and forth on either side of the border, carrying public health 
uh, issues and people to treat so rather setting up something permanent these mobile units they've been very effective in the past so others here may know more than I I know a lot about mobile units in uh, Asia and Africa where yes there have been a lot and I do know that there have been projects along the US Mexico border involving mobile laboratories but I you know it's a good question and I'm sorry I don't know more it, it's something that really should be taken advantage of, especially with rapid diagnostic techniques yeah. and the ability to treat. I know that the one thing that I've seen are a lot more um, um, community clinics that provide comprehensive care. And I visited one recently in El Paso that was amazing, funded by a special grant through HRSA. So they're focusing, and 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 then they also are fo are um, planning on implementing additional like out of those community clinics, mobile centers for testing and treatment. But I don't think a lot of that has gotten off the ground. I think there's only been pilots. But I do know that that's something that HRSA is really focusing on with pilot projects in these community centers. Yes? How would you rate the level of coordination, cooperation, and collaboration between border projects and Mexican counterparts? So I think that, um, I think it's very good. We our offices our our offices for border health are um, focused. Even though it's out of our office, it's in El Paso, and the Mexican counterpart is in Juarez. Which, if you've been there, is basically one city with a river going through it. You know, it's very close, and um, we have office space for them that they come, and we have very regular meetings. And I think the level of coordination is great. I think what we need to work on next is what we're. I was saying before, which is really now strategizing where should we focus for the best impact and how are we going to measure that impact. The relationships, though, are all there and the willingness is there. <clears throat> yes. I was, was going to, well, a number of people have talked about different agencies being involved, and there's actually another part of HHS that could be more involved uh, if Texas was interested in doing more of an expansion of the Medicaid program mm -hmm. to for adults because for those I, I run a Medicaid HMO so I okay. best is interested in this I admit <laughs> but you know for we don't see a whole lot of, of these kind of diseases in pregnant women and children that we cover now but in the adult population uh, and, and 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 folks that are uninsured low income population especially along the uh, the border you know a lot of these as you talked about are are very treatable early on but for people that don't uh, get care right away. So there's a whole other potential uh, source of funds and, and opportunities to, to work on this on, on the border if states like Texas would be a little bit more enlightened about getting people insurance coverage. So that's an excellent idea. I mean, thank you. I'm not sure that's, that's um, out of my, what you're saying is out of my jurisdiction, but. Yeah. <laughs> But that's a comment, not a question, I hope. Yes. Yes, great. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I wanted to add on the 4C, which is that of capital. What can you comment about the investment that the U.S. has really to work with Mexico and to create more infrastructure, better infrastructure, better response, and really strengthen collaboration and therefore impact? So I would add that as a 4C, which is capital. Right. Um, so this Border Health Commission is really not a lot of money. It's really seed money. And um, the goal of that is to get the states working together so that they can take the money that they get through state or federal, however that is, and put it towards projects. And we may fund pilot projects, but really, you know, communication and bringing everyone together. I think most people would probably say uh, sorely underfunded, and we need to find ways to get additional funding. I mean, I, I don't think that there's a lot of, um, you know, there's a lot of room from the states in the U.S. and probably in Mexico to uh, work on border. There's a lot of interest, but there's really not a lot of money going there. So that's, you know, that's where there's a big need for adv advocacy and for recognition is to get the investment in the border that's really going to be a critical part of this. Yes. So two questions. Um, how, do, how do you feel in terms of health infrastructure in the U.S.? How do you feel we're equipped in terms of our own health workforce uh, to screen, diagnose, and treat neglected tropical diseases? And is that a function of the CDC to sort of proliferate training and sort of in many of these neglected tropical diseases that are moving into the U.S.? 
question one. Question two, um, in terms of the World Health Organization, I noticed you mentioned 14 NTDs and WHO tends to um, promote the 17 NTDs. I'm curious in terms of what's that coordinating role and, and how does that work in terms of you working together? If right, so WHO comes out with um, policies and guidance. You know, they're a normative agency that countries then um, you know, there, there's different ways. There's resolutions, which basically countries pass at the annual meeting at the World Health Assembly, and those are by consensus. So when those pass, really every country has a responsibility to try to, to, try to meet those. I don't know, it's not 100% perfect, but it, it's not bad. Then there are guidelines that come out, and those are meant for countries to try to follow antiretroviral treatment guidelines or TB treatment guidelines or laboratory testing. You know, there's hundreds of guidelines that they produce. And then countries, you know, those are meant to be roadmaps for countries, but countries don't necessarily vote on those that they're going to be implementing all of those guidelines. So, you know, our, with the U.S., we don't interpret those guidelines for U.S., implementation that's done with domestic agencies whether it's going to be medicare medicaid or cdc coming out with guidance training tends to be not through cdc but through other funding domestic funding mechanisms like hrsa cdc really is our normative agency to provide guidelines and but also to pr provide technical assistance for implementation in um, states, and then has an international also focus. Uh, what was your first question? I'm sorry. I was gonna. Do you feel the health workforce in the U.S. is equipped to screen, diagnose, treat, and to do? There probably is someone better in the audience <laughs> to answer that. I'm. I, I'm. You know. I don't know. I. I would imagine. You know. Definitely, the skills are there, but what's probably needed is the training because you don't see them much. And so it's probably not so much in people's minds. But if there are other experts here, please feel free to add. Yeah. I can add to that, too. But, um, and again, through our school you know, here at Baylor College of Medicine, uh, in addition, and thank you very much for highlighting our tropical medicine clinic, because it's actually us working with Harris Health that we uh, established that in, 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 with the intent to indeed ensure that there was a location where physicians found an ability of them to refer patients. But at the same time, we also have programs that indeed are trying to um, add to the curriculum of the medical schools that raises the, the knowledge of these diseases. I mean, you study them, but you may not necessarily see them anymore, especially in the laboratory. So we have hands-on training programs, and we're now expanding them not only for the um, student in training, but also the professional in their professional advancement. Because for example, when you mentioned leishmaniasis or Chagas disease, um, even though it, there may be that perception that you don't see it very often, um, the fact is that even if you do see it, it would not be detected right. because the physician doesn't think about it as the first um, rationale of why this person has cardiomyopathy, for example, in Chagas disease. Um, so I think it, indeed it's, it's, it's important that we um, build that um, new education capacity and training capacity because the skills are there. It's just a reminder that now um, you know, we have to remember that these diseases can also impact within our state and within our you know, country. Great. Thank you very much. Yes. Um, so uh, NTDs are a growing issue at the border, and there's also problems since NTDs, for a lot of them, they're not treatable, especially in the chronic stages, but then at the same time, um, they might not be seen as profitable diseases to invest in treatment since they tend to affect the poor. So I'm just wondering if um, beyond product development partnerships, if there's um, any other sustainable mechanisms that could promote innovation and ensure that the medicines remain accessible? Yeah, so that's a great question and a very complicated question. And again, I would invite people after I answer to please tell me what you think, because I think it would be good to hear from other people who are involved in different areas. I, sorry to mention Ebola again, but I think that E the e Ebola shined a light on 
on development of vaccines and countermeasures, vaccines and, you know, vaccines and drugs and vaccines for kind of neglected or unprofitable diseases. And um, there were vaccines in the pipeline that Department of Defense, Canada, and parts of the U.S. were developing, and it was going at the normal pace, which takes a long time. Due to the emergency, these vaccine trials were tested in the U.S. and started at an unbelievably, unbelievably compressed space. Like within six months, they were doing trials. It, no one had ever seen it happen that fast. As in kind of the aftermath, um, a major discussion that's going on in the U.S. government is what are we going to do about these diseases that either affect a lot of people, potentially affect a lot of people, and probably aren't going to make a lot of money for, um, for companies who do the research and development. So is the U.S. going to subsidize um, those companies? Is the U.S. going to, you know, the U.S. has a unit that in HHS called BARDA, which stands, I'm sorry, it's, I'm going to blank on what it stands for, but that actually that's what they do. That's one of the things that they do is they fund um, important you know, uh, research on important vaccines and drugs f where that might not otherwise be, you know, be, be funded because they might not be profitable. And so there's been a lot of talk about how we're going to get together with um, research and development companies and how the funding is going to go to address that. So I don't have an answer for you what's going to happen now, but there is a major initiative in the U.S. government that's really been kicked from Ebola to get this started. And there may be others here who have more uh, knowledge on that that I'd be happy to hear. Maybe I can just add, um, I, I'm the medical director for DNDI, Drugs for Neglected Diseases in Latin America. Um, first of all, it was a pleasure to hear your, your presentation. Um, DNDI basically works on that. It was an organization created um, more than 10 years ago by Doctors Without Borders, uh, the TDR, Institute Pasteur, so different institutions in the world that basically um, aimed at looking at those diseases that were considered disease that were not really profitable in terms of market market you know value and put together different organizations such as academic institutions uh, research development or pharmaceutical companies and then through this model of partnerships developed so far six uh, medicines for diseases such as Leishmaniasis, visceral leishmaniasis, uh, sleeping sickness. So it's a, it's a model, and I think it's a it's one model that you know one needs to, to look carefully because it has delivered um, six treatments so far. But definitely there is room for more uh, organizations like that and different models also that can address the huge gap between one billion plus people living with neglected diseases and the pharmaceutical companies and the expertise and the knowledge that is out there. So I think um, it's one model, it's one way of looking at this and addressing those diseases, but definitely there are many other models to be explored. You've hit on a, it's a very big and difficult issue. I thought I saw someone else's hand. One more question? All right, well, um, I'd like to thank Dr. Wolf for coming and giving us his uh, background on U.S. Uh, all of our projects that we're doing on NTDs, and I'd like to thank you for being here. Thank you. It's been great being here. I appreciate it.